everyone. Welcome. This is the Aquarium Insider Podcast with your host. My name is Dan Connor. And today I'm here with Alex Williamson from the Secret History Living Inside Your Aquarium. Super excited to have him on the podcast today. We're going to kind of dive in and talk about the top 10 moments that have moved the aquarium hobby forward, which I thought was super cool, interesting. So I'm I'm super excited about this. Alex, thanks again for uh, for coming on and doing this, man. I appreciate it a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to to be here as well. And uh, you know, any any chance I can have to nerd out about some fish stuff, uh, you know, it's it's good for me. It's good for my marriage for me to have someone to talk to other than my wife hearing the same uh, you know things over and over. So awesome. Thanks. Yeah, I, I feel like uh, I'm in the same boat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, um, could you uh, actually could you introduce yourself? Talk to a little people talk to everybody about, you know, kind of what you do with fish and then how did you get into doing more of the history side of things? Yeah. So, um, obviously I'm Alex Williamson and, uh, I have a, uh, YouTube channel called the secret history living inside your aquarium. I know it's a nice, short, concise name. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I made it. I made it so long because really it was kind of a diary for myself. And so I wanted to note uh, any historic figures that were interesting. And I was also kind of, I've kept fish since I was a little kid. I bred guppies for profit. Um, as a teenager, I've bred, uh, other things as a challenge as I got into my older teen years. Uh, and you know, as a kid, I've always had a goldfish or something, but by the time I was a teenager, you know, I had multiple tanks and, and all that. And, into the teenage years, I started getting into bigger fish and cichlids and Oscars and things like that. And so I had always had this kind of love for animals in general, but fish were a nice, easy ecosystem to kind of keep in the house and um, be able to take with me a lot of places, but not bog me down if I wanted to travel or whatnot. And so when I went to college, uh, I studied uh, history and anthropology. So I studied uh, basically post-colonial mostly uh, history of the, the Middle East. So kind of more modern uh, last 150 years history of Middle East and, and uh, Africa, specifically Northern Africa. And then uh, for anthropology, I studied Native American uh, Coast Salish tribes, which are based here where I'm at in Seattle, Washington. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's the tribes from basically Oregon all the way up to uh, Canada that live along the coast and the Puget Sound here. And uh, once I got that degree, I, I had entered college with some high school uh i had some college credits from high school and so i was then able to kind of spend a little more time on the degree and i decided to go for uh, my archaeology or physical anthropology degree and that's when i started really kind of linking fish in history because so much um so much of the material culture that we find in the Northwest is based around salmon or whaling or fishing or mussels and oysters and shellfish. And we find here uh, what we call shell middens, which are basically uh, where the Native American folks would uh, process their catches or um, next to a fireplace where they would, uh, you know, stay for, several years or even you know long long houses happened up here where the the natives were not nomadic a lot of them were sedentary and so uh, unlike a lot of the rest of the united states native americans we have sometimes these uh basically trenches they dug that they'd fill with shells and and you know food compost piles basically and we can go back and some of them are you know seven eight thousand years old and we can literally see what they were eating but it's it's a very seafood based thing and so it's all you know it's kind of interests me and they used um everything from clam shells and um teeth of uh different fish and and sharks and uh you know the skin of sharks the different things they used as tools, you know, like they use as sandpaper or they used it as uh, to shave with clamshells uh, and used it even to make weapons and things too. So it, it, it plays a pretty heavy role 
in what I got into when I was in uh, doing archaeology. And uh, once I finished school, I graduated, uh, finished up all that and worked on my thesis. Uh, so I got it all done in five years with the archaeology degree included. And that then uh, I graduated <laughs> in uh, 2000 and uh, nine basically is when I was scheduled to graduate. And, uh, that's when the economy had just really fallen out. So I never got a job having to do with it, but I did keep fish, um, just as a hobby. I just had community tanks and, uh, then I, I, uh, never did get back into it. I actually have been doing art and graphic design, which were more passion things for me. Uh, and, and so, it, it was, uh, I, again, I uh, later had some health issues. Um, I was diagnosed with lupus, and I was not able to do some of the, the other jobs that I'd had. And so I decided to um, get back into um, graphic design and art and things like that rather than any physical jobs um, in retail or anything like that. And around the same time, I moved back to Seattle from um, the town I went to a university in and, uh, I couldn't keep fish for a period. And by the time I was able to keep fish again, I'd really started missing them. And my life had really changed a lot. I was living in a small space rather than a, a you know, a big shared house with college kids where anything goes, where I could have, um, you know, a, a piranha or a dovi or, you know, whatever crazy fish I wanted. Nobody was going <laughs> to say anything when you live with a bunch of guys that are in college. Uh, but you know, the, then a new level, uh, you know, I meet my wife and she, she enjoys animals, but she also has house plants and home decor. And so we, we kind of said, you know, this can't turn into one of those stinky hidden fish room kind of things. Uh, it needs, it needs to be a little bit more refined. And so I started actually learning about aquascaping. And so the secret history living in your aquarium was kind of a confluence of all that, and it was the aquascaping with um, my my background that I didn't ever really use that much. I I do a lot of my research using methodology uh, where I go through you know scholarly journals and look at new information. I look at archaeological uh, finds and interpretations by uh, anthropologists, physical uh, anthropologists, material culture um, pr predominantly, and you know. Uh, now that the the channel has grown it's it's kind of uh almost like i feel an obligation or duty or a a drive to keep putting out new uh episodes new information as we learn things and as it's been vetted by science as as uh previous uh guesses or speculation get replaced by um evidence uh I want to come, come forward and talk about that on my channel. So, yeah. Oh my gosh. That's awesome. I mean, a lot, a lot to going on there, but that's yeah, sorry cool about that long to, story. <laughs> no, you're good. I, was, I, I like the, uh, the historical and anthropo anthropological background. Cause I think that plays really well with obviously, like you mentioned, like going back in the history thing and really using like a science-based approach to really find a new info and saying, this is a, this is probably a more accurate description of, you know, stuff we'll probably talk about during this thing so yeah and you know people uh, a lot of times might not think of it right off the bat but when you get an archaeology degree you have to study uh, anatomy biology and then depending on what you're working with and since i was working with native american uh sites here you know i had to learn all of the marine animal uh anatomy and biology because you're you're going through stuff that's a lot of times crushed or it's been processed for for eating and disassembled and um a lot of it's reassembling skeletons or, you know, um, articulating, as we say, uh, wiring back up skeletons and finding out, okay, there's a, a dog in the same pit as the food. Why wasn't it in its own grave? You know, things like that. But in the process, you have to learn geology. You have to learn a lot of different things. And, and it all kind of comes around to things that are then kind of useful for fish keeping in general. I mean, uh, things like acidity and, and, uh, you know, uh, the, how sediments are laid down over time and nitrogen and carbon cycles and things like that. So uh, it's really surprising how much of it comes back, um, from that, that specific degree 
to kind of inform the hobby um, and fits together nicely, you know? Yeah, that's, man, that's a, th there's a lot going on there, but definitely for sure. That's, it's so relatable as far as like the stuff that you're doing fish keeping. And I really like the tie into the aquascaping because that's one. I, I enjoy that. I'm not very good at it. I enjoy things to look nice. I'm not the best things that make them look pretty, but I do like the idea of just making it more. Um, what's a good word for it. I don't know. Cohesive. I don't know. That's why I, that's why yeah. I think of, that's why I think of aquascaping. Like it's, it's a cohesive environment. It's, I don't know. That's just the way I, I, did, I look at it. Well, and I think that like, for instance, Diane Wallstead, um, and, and like the, the completely, uh, balanced aquarium or the, the notion that everything you need, like kind of, uh, not completely closed loop, but a fairly closed ecosystem where you're not having to tinker with things and change the water all the time and have, um, machinery and things, uh, kind of getting back to nature sort of thing. Uh, to me, that was really appealing because growing up, my aquariums had no plants. They had, uh, annoying colors of gravel. And, uh, to me now, like it, it almost is like, Oh, why did I do that? Um, and it's no, no uh, shame to anybody who that's what they enjoy their tanks looking like. But for me, it, it really does have to do with, I find, peace and solace in nature and uh i want a piece of that in my house and um I, I love to be able to to go out into a tranquil creek or a tropical river or whatever it may be in each little tank that i keep um every night you know so that's what i really like about it so yeah i like i think same basically i, I try to use my my own home aquariums as that same issue i think it's been a real good peace for me in the hectic world we live in <laughs> yeah especially the last you know uh 18 months or whatnot yeah. um and that's really kind of um solidified the the goal the aim the direction of the channel as well it's kind of you know locked into place who comes by to to, to listen for what and um it, it's allowed a niche hobby to emerge where i think a lot of people were at home and we had aquarists that were interested in this kind of stuff and then you have beginners and things that um are maybe just history fans and so they kind of get siphoned off and interested in it uh but it's definitely not the same as a lot of the youtube channels where it's really like um beginning um how to and introduction stuff yeah. um yeah so. awesome all right well let's go ahead and dive into sort of like where do we begin so what time period are we going to begin in as far as like where did this sort of start taking place in yeah so i mean this is going to be probably debated forever but what i think of as the first uh, event or moment innovation that really starts and lays the the groundwork for us being able to keep fish whether that be for food or whether that be for pure amusement uh is the ability to catch them and so we, we have to look at nets and ponds and uh, basically the, the human control of a natural environment uh, allowing fish to survive. And uh, obviously there's no glass or anything, but we're talking about uh, we've found braided uh, products made of, uh, you know, that would, that would resemble an, a net as, as we think of it today. Uh, going back as far back as 28,000 years ago now. Uh, we, we've, we Rope doesn't last very well, uh, but there were uh, these circular stones that we know were used 10,000 years ago. We, we know we found rope and things where we know their purpose was for throwing weighted nets to catch fish. Um, and so sometimes the stone sinkers, uh, the weights, are what survive and those those would be hand worked into kind of a donut shaped thing and they would run that on the corners of the nets or the side of the nets and then they'd toss that you know to help the net sink faster and catch the fish um, but the other thing we have is we have living oral a tradition from native american uh from hawaiian for instance from polynesian and um samoan uh new zealanders um and fijians uh samo yeah samoan fijians solomon islands as well they all kept uh, they built you know stone ponds and kept fish and so there's no reason to believe 
the same is not true for all around the world because we see that in uh, the Levant, you know, going back 8,000, 9,000 years, we see structures and we see illustrations of um, water being contained by humans. So both the net and the pond are, are, as well as fish traps and weirs, all that kind of goes together. But I mean, we're looking at probably 40,000 years ago, at least that people started saying, let's control this factor. Let's bring the food or the, the fish to us rather than um, having to go seek them out all the time. So, yeah. Yeah. I was, um, what kind of, I mean, one thing I just said, I, I've always heard China started with carp, right? Egypt sort of did tilapia a little bit. Mm-hmm. And then Hawaii, what kind of, if they're catching fish for either food or they're enclosing things, what kind of fish were they? I assume food fish would make the most sense, right? But what were they looking? What kind of fish do you think? Yeah, so there was definitely food fish going on um, in all of these places. Uh, the Native Americans here in Washington State in the United States, um, the San Juan Islands, they actually had a specific island where the salmon run would happen and they would funnel the salmon through with canoes and uh, splashing paddles and as well as, you know, um, sea lions and, and um, uh, orcas would naturally congregate this time of year to feed on the run. And so the, the humans would scare them to one side and then they would stay on the other. And they kind of would work together in that you've got this wall of predatory, predatory mammals eating the fish. So they all go through this little inlet that's kind of a narrow passageway between the islands. And they used to actually net that off on Lopez Island in the San Juans. And they would get tons, hundreds of pounds, you know, thousands of pounds of salmon, so much so that they couldn't process it, you know, from one day's run. It used to be so heavy. Um, So a lot of food fish. And and we see that by finding the processed um, uh, materials and also things like stones where maybe – the the meat was tenderized or it, mm. the the uh, skin was from the fish. So we see specific tools that are very different than say cutting uh, deep into a, a tissue or something. Like you have these very like descaling stones and things like that, where oh. it's pretty clear that um, you find in a pit a bunch of uh, scales and you find uh, you know little bones like little uh, rib bones and things. And then you find a a shell tool uh, that's been shaped clearly by humans. uh, And you kind of put two and two together and you get four with um, that they were processing, you know, the fish there. And so, yeah, it was mostly food fish. But but as we talk about the enclosures becoming more and more elaborate, like in Rome and in Egypt and the the Mediterranean in general, um, we start seeing industry pop up where uh, garum is a, a, a kind of like a ketchup or a vinegar. Uh, it's, it's like a side dish or, or a, I guess it's a condiment of sorts. They, they would put on all sorts of food all across uh, the Mediterranean. Um, we're talking 4,000 to 5,000 to 2,000 years ago being its real like heyday, but it was traded from, um, Carthage in North Africa and, uh, Tunis, Tunisia, uh, and then all the way to Egypt, to Greece, to Rome, uh, Spain, and it required catching fish. It was a fish based sauce. And so they actually had big, big um, holding pens made out of stone and brick uh, where they would would manage that, both in some of the Mediterranean island, um, I guess at the time you might not call them nations because they were part of larger empires and things, but um, they were, you know, fish became a big business and money and there's that aspect of it. And so technology to catch them becomes more uh, refined, but also we start seeing in many cultures, like you were saying in, in China, you know, we start seeing that the carp was probably initially used for food. And then it became so associated with a specific port city or a, um, you know, a, a group of people that when they get in power and 
they become, you know, the, the people who made a uh, carp, uh, soup or whatever it may have been, you know, they become uh, a ruling family or something. And that is uh, the, the heart of their uh, daily life uh, is processing that fish, things like that. Then we start seeing almost religious cults popping up with other fish. Um, so in Egypt, we find mormorids, um, which are known as the elephant fish or the the knife fish, as, as a lot of people have seen them. But they actually give off a little bit of electricity. And so there's also conjecture that, um, you know, were was there some sort of use where maybe something felt tingly or, you know, when you get a bunch of them together, there could have been something kind of uh, mystical about the their ability to, to put off electricity. Um, and so it's just in, interesting that we start seeing uh, laws as well as um, depictions in the artwork of pharaohs in Egypt uh, saying, you know, it's against the law to kill these fish. And in those same shell middens where, where you know, in North America, we find everything that they threw away to eat. In Egypt, we were missing all mormorid skeletons from the physical his, historic record, the archaeological record. And we'd kind of always wondered why. And uh, it had been noted because every other species of fish in the Nile seemed to be accounted for, plus many saltwater fish and stuff mm -hmm. from far away. But then more recently, in fact, just this year, there's been papers written about how they've discovered that there were preserved mormorids in essentially like a mummified condition in these jars and um, given the same honors as, you know, cats and dogs that were loyal uh, to the pharaohs. And so there, there's images too. They found an image of a pharaoh sitting on a throne with his feet uh, surrounded. You can find the picture online actually, but the, he, his feet are surrounded by, uh, mormorids and, and fish. And, uh, there's something going on there that's a little different than food. And so I think that arguably you could say, and that's, we're looking at 4,900 years ago. Uh, yeah. arguably that could be, you know, the first pet fish, if you want to call it that. It's, it's a little different than we would think of. But at the same time, you know, it, it's hard to pinpoint when that transferred from, are they processing fish for some sort of food use? Um, or, you know, is this just one pharaoh that was into it? But it seems to be a sustained thing because we don't find the bones of the marmorid in the, in the food uh, refuse dumps. We find it buried or set aside uh, more carefully placed um, all throughout mm -hmm. a several thousand year period. Um, it's similar to cats, actually. I mean, a lot of people might be familiar with cats being um, venerated in, in ancient Egypt. Uh, but then the the best record keeping that we really have is, is China and the carp, the koi and goldfish. Uh, eventually, you know, they go from keeping silver and shiny fish around probably 2,500 years ago uh, and saying, let's not eat these ones. They're kind of our token symbol of um, how much we rely on the fish and, and things like that to also just a show of, I have fresh, clean water and I have fish that I could eat. I have these excess things that I've built up, but I don't even need to eat them, you know, or I have this unique fish. There's one, uh, one that's a gold color and so then they get into the genetics of the fish and start breeding fish. And and it, it, likewise, it became illegal for anybody in China to own a carp that had golden scales by around 2000. But they were definitely the first that we know of to domesticate, quote unquote, or, or intentionally change the attributes of the fish to suit their desires. And and really by 1500 years ago, it's a solidly established in their culture to keep fish as a purely ornamental decorative. And just kind of, um, it shows that you don't have to work, that you have this extra wealth, uh, have a pond, have someone to take care of the pond and to keep these creatures alive. I mean, you're, you're kind of taking the forces of nature and showing you have mastery over of them. Wow. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a good point because it, you know, 
so we talked about a little bit of unpacking it there for a minute. So we've talked about obviously a lot of in the beginning probably still looked like food. And then we started seeing some, probably some religious aspects in some, at least some of the Mormons, right? Yeah. So there's a couple yeah. different acts, but access of, of fish being used. And then obviously China being domesticated them to kind of manipulate them to look like differently and really showcase their, I guess their status or their wealth would make the most sense. Definitely. Is that, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And, and, and I mean, that, that kind of ties into the, the second innovation, which is kind of a continuance of the first one, but it's really fountains and aeration. Uh, the number okay. two item on the list that I've kind of compiled here in my mind. And, and you could change these around, you could pick something different, but to me going through, it seems like these are pivotal or key um, things that push our concept of the hobby or it being a hobby period forward. And, you know, we may not have known that fish needed air, but you could look in a, in a, if you catch fish, put them in a barrel and you're trying to keep them alive so that they're not rotten when they're at market, you can see that they gasp for air at the top, many species, you know? So it doesn't take that much. I mean, I feel like even in ancient times, it, it's not that hard of a leap to understand that maybe we need to to, to give them air, like splash water, um, move yeah. the water around or, or it's, there's something, you know, we need their gills need water running over them. You can figure out what kills a fish versus what allows it to live. But as societies start to congregate around cities and they find all sorts of ways to show their excess wealth, you start seeing, I mean, and this is backtracking a little bit, it kind of overlaps, but Babylon and, and for instance, the, the wonders of the ancient world, the hanging gardens of Babylon or modern day, just outside of where uh, Baghdad would be. Um, they, it, it's by so many different cultures and texts that this was a real place and that they had very um, amazing understanding of irrigation and water pumps and fountains and uh, hydrodynamic um, you know, or fluid dynamics and things like that. Uh, obviously they figured out irrigation as well. Um, but the same areas we had talked about um, in the last segment of making an industry out of it, they also started uh, keeping things like catfish and um, carp and eels, things like this, um, not necessarily re like having them reproduce or anything in captivity, but keeping the adult ones uh, or interesting ones, maybe they find an albino one or something that's of interest. And they would offer that as a gift, you know, to their local uh, ruler or to the emperor or pharaoh or leader in the area. Um, and it's kind of the similar notion of, of a zoo or something where you want to collect the things from your empire that are far flung and kind of just show uh, all the, the things under the sun that are uh, impressive or interesting. Uh, it helps add to your, your myth or your, your status, uh, essentially. Yeah. And, yeah, so, uh, you know, the Greek and Romans then are kind of next known for their massive uh, fountain mastery. Uh, you kind of think of a lot of traditional art with that. And they really start understanding there with, you know, Archimedes and um, you've got, you've got all your kind of classic, uh, you know, Socrates, Archimedes. Uh, you've got these people, um, uh, Heron, he was known for a fountain basically that uh, would recharge itself with a reservoir. And so they were able to put fountains all throughout Rome, for instance, like capital city. And as that empire took over uh, a lot of Europe and the middle East and in North Africa, I mean, they, they brought that technology with them, but really it lays the groundwork for um, siphoning water out of a tank, even just basic things of how we move water, keep water, um, water wheels, uh, screws, uh, water screws, pumps, uh, wells, things like that. And also understanding, you know, how to settle debris out of water, how to filter water. Um, the fact that the sun helps kill bacteria or it grows algae. So just a lot of the basic understanding of 
water comes from the fact that we have these public water sources that were supposed to be kept up to snuff in uh, uh, many cultures at this time. All right. So I was thinking of some qu some questions about that while you're kind of going through that. So now correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. So Rome and them obviously had the fountains they were using to move water to different places and they were doing, I guess I don't know this answer. Were they using irrigation at the time as well? Like, like, uh, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, I figured you, they were. Yeah. If you think about, um, they they were known in Rome and before them, the Greeks too, but aqueducts were literally for, you know, oh, yeah. 60, 60 miles, they would plan out where there's a mountain lake and then everything that's a lower elevation from that lake, you know, they would uh, be able to farm areas that normally wouldn't have a river there and whatnot. So yeah, they, they became more and more, uh, adept at controlling that stuff until kind of the, the, the fall, maybe around 200 AD, specifically the Romans. Yeah. Of that. So, so, so once we get in that time period, like 200 AD, where, where does the next sort of, uh, part take us as far as the next pivotal moment you think? Right. Um, so as far as the Western world or Europe, Africa, um, West Asia, near East, as they call it, uh, goes, it, it almost falls off a cliff. I mean, there is water in fountains and things, but a, as we call it the dark ages, it's not that things stayed the same, you know, for 500 years or whatnot, but there was kind of uh, this shining moment. And before it, there were kind of moments like that in Egyptian history, all the way back to like the first dynasty and the second dynasty. Uh, if you're into history, you'll know that, that history and culture kind of has these high points where um, there's uh, usually when there's hegemony and there's one control uh, f controlling force over a large area then um, and not war constantly interrupting. And there's a lot of um, excess time and people with power and money essentially, but that gets disrupted and there's, there's plagues and there's all sorts of um, issues that come into play. There's also, uh, we think uh, a small ice age that happens uh, around 550, 600 AD uh, that also was uh, pretty devastating, we think. Um, but really the next period is the, the Renaissance. So we kind of take a big jump. Technology kind of continues. And it's really people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci. Um, when you start seeing his concepts of building things like submarines, things like uh, flying machines. I mean, it's kind of this new paradigm of um, it's not to say that maybe he was the first to do that, but he was definitely the one that throughout history, we kind of pinpoint as at least taking credit for it or um, being the, one of the pivotal minds that, that, that uh, assembled these, thoughts and some of them were ancient but needed some some refinement and uh that's kind of the next period and and you'd say that i mean up through the renaissance period uh, 1400s 1500s 1600s you've still got china chucking along and uh japan as well into that period where they're actually starting to keep fish uh, as well as down in Southeast Asia, you've got bettas and half beaks. Now we know the half beak oh. is, uh, is only recently been known to have been kept as far back as it is. But um, during this same period, we do have um, what we used to call Chinese fighting fish or Thai, Ch uh, Thai fighting fish um, or Sia Siamese fighting fish, uh, which is the betta splendens and uh, as well as a few other betta species. But we just recently this year also did some DNA testing and found that it's been at least a thousand years that they've been bred in captivity, judging by their mitochondrial DNA. Um, and that means wow. that basically uh, very, very implausible uh, recessive traits were being found in the DNA over and over and over again for generations at that point, which looks very different than a native population uh, when you catch a wild betta versus, you know, uh, and that's, that's humans doing uh, selective breeding is what that really is. So that, 
that gets better. And it's not just fish that this occurs with it. It all also during um, the Renaissance up into what we call the enlightenment period. Um, okay. That's, that's the European period, you know, and you can argue that it starts in late 1600s, early 1700s, but basically it, it, it goes on up through the, into the 18 fifties or so is usually kind of when they consider it. Uh, but it's, it's the whole thought of reason and science. Um, really that's, you know, Newton and Newtonian physics and all that kind of stuff is what we think of it as. But what it really means is it's an ushering in of, uh, not believing in superstition or the world as it is because your authority, uh, your state, your elders, your culture says so, but because there is empirical or scientific method backed evidence of it being so. And so right. it's really a, a huge questioning of everything. And there's a, a large power, uh, you know, power play going on with all this where uh, church is trying to maintain their influence and old systems are trying to maintain their power over lands and things. Uh, and the people are really, um, it's possible now to make strives and, and it really changes everything forever as society in that your mind and your thoughts have a intrinsic value. Um, whereas before you were born into your station and not that social mobility happened right away, but there, there was the, the possibility that, you know, a poor person could have this ambition to learn and acquire skills and knowledge. And that can't be stripped from you. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, you can't take that away. It's not gold, coins or something that uh, will go away and it can be passed on. And so it, it helps uh, build upon itself just by the nature of that. And, and the fact that we have writing and by that point we have the printing press. So communication really starts spreading and, and that kind of number three on our list is definitely the enlightenment and the naturalist movement, which, you know, out of Scotland, out of Berlin, um, Edinburgh, Scotland, London, um, the United States, you got New York and, um, as well as, uh, um, Boston and, uh, uh, pencil, uh, various places in, in Pennsylvania and Virginia, but you've got all these places that are starting to actually, talk to each other, you know, by the 1700s. And by 1659, you've got the Portuguese um, also going around the world and, and doing things. And so overlapping with this uh, will be our, our fourth point. But, but basically, I mean, this is when we also see the gourami or the paradise fish um, introduced into the hobby from uh, Asia and brought back by the Portuguese in uh, in the late 16 mid to late 1600s, and then uh, goldfish happening uh, after that. Um, or sorry, I'm I'm so sorry. Uh, goldfish happening in the six, late 1690s. Sorry, 1859 is when the paradise fish came. Got my mm. years mis mixed around there, but uh, yeah, 1859 was the year that the, the paradise fish came before that though goldfish came back with the Portuguese in the 1590s. And so the, the goldfish, um, became also a fad. Um, and so you could argue that the, it had already been kept as a pet for a while because China had been keeping koi and goldfish as pets, but with the, uh, knowledge of, um, breeding animals and the knowledge, you know, husbandry and genetics uh, that's going on in Europe. When that meets what the Chinese have done to modify the fish, you start seeing things like um, color morphs, tails, just more people involved in the breeding process mm -hmm. and in the care process, uh, more hands in the pot. You get a lot more options and the goldfish becomes kind of fetishized and it's a trend in the upper class people uh, definitely start collecting goldfish. And at the same time, 
they start collecting um, mollusks and snails. So you get um, everything from land snails to saltwater snails and coastal regions. But there was also quite the trend uh, in the, all the way going back to the Elizabethan period, as we call it up into the Victorian period, you've got these, um, trends that kind of sweep the upper class or the people with free time who aren't busy working the land or working in, in some craft. And you start also seeing the import of goods uh, from around the world. Uh, and I'll pause after I say that that leads us nicely into the fourth big change, which is now that we've got the mindset change and the science and the breeding down the, the concepts that will lay the groundwork for that from the enlightenment. We've got number four, which is uh, colonialism and Europe kind of going out and taking over the world essentially. Uh, I mean, it, if it weren't for that, the goldfish wouldn't have been traded for and brought back to Europe period. So um, that's kind of the next big stopping point on our exploration of these events. Yeah. So I do have a question related to this. So I was trying to think about how I wanted to word it. But so when we talk about Portugal going, I think you mentioned going to China, getting the goldfish, and that was like 1590s ish. And that's essentially when world, like international trade, you know, I don't know what, not countries, but international trade amongst the different places starts opening up. That's when we start to see this movement of fish from place to place, I guess, if that makes sense, right? To make sure I heard yeah. you. Okay. How do yeah. they. How do you think they would transport the fish from place to place? So it actually was very labor intensive. It's not just a trivial little goldfish. You know, it, right. was, seen, it was seen as, wow, the Chinese and Japanese uh, royalty really value these things. Um, let's, let's bring them back. Or in some cases they were gifted uh, as kind of a status thing. And so, we see that also these ornate ceramic bowls um, or China, as we call it in the West, um, fine China was brought back as well. And in Europe, they use the technology that advanced during the Renaissance period of glass blowing and um, using uh, different materials, whether that be different uh, ceramics. And really it was kind of um, the fish was, almost secondary in a lot of cases to the aquarium. Uh, it, it was very ornate. And if you've seen Victorian era aquariums, you know that they had, they started casting um, a metal aquarium frames and things where you've got just immensely detailed scroll work and flowers and leaves and yeah. the feet look like lion's paws. And, you know, so the aquarium itself, is actually uh, at this point in time, it's not that approachable of a thing for most people. It's more of the upper class and um, the goldfish does transcend that a little bit. And when you're saying about how did they get the goldfish back? Um, they actually had someone who was instructed on how to take care of them and they had to bring oh. fresh water for water changes but essentially goldfish do pretty well in a bowl so as long as they were able to stay in the uh, under deck in the cabins uh and their water was changed and they were um fed or even just algae growing um you know they're a pretty hardy fish they can withstand temperature changes and whatnot and um that's not to say that they all survived the, the journey, you know, and right. when, when the paradise fish and, uh, betas and garamis were brought back, uh, by the Portuguese or by, uh, yeah, by the Portuguese also, um, you know, and then by later by the French and English, they're all a lot trickier. And yes, they were still using large sailing ships, but there was definitely a limit and it had to be kind of a, a handful of fish that would survive you know, months at sea and yeah. you have to plan accordingly uh, and have a person to take care of them. And we'll talk about that in this colonial period and towards the end of the colonial period, you know, um, you know, I, I just want to also say that 
at the same time as this enlightenment and colonial periods kind of overlap and start going on, you have really incredible minds, uh, you know, like Jean Villepoux Powers. She was a woman uh, born in the 1700s, uh, but who wrote pretty much the definitive first book that outlines the aquarium. And it's oh, wow. very similar to Diane Wallstead's uh, book in, in the sense that, you know, they believe that you need to have snails and you needed to have um, little microorganisms, even though they didn't know what they did. But the goal was to take the outside and put it in a box, put a glass on it and watch it. You know, she watched creatures out in their habitat as well as trying to recreate their habitat in a box. And so you know, things like flowing water, things like, um, the basics of how a tank is laid out with the glass sides. Before that, we were keeping things in fountains, ponds, and bowls. And really, it's that period that we start seeing the aquarium as we know it. Now, there's uh, there's a man in the 1500s in the Netherlands. There's a Dutch guy uh, who also has something similar to an aquarium where one side has some glass, uh, but it's a, essentially a box, and it's just kind of an observation thing. Uh, but Jean Villepreux Power was really the first uh, naturalist or scientist to um, at least document, and also we know and have records of her con, like her hiring someone, contracting someone to build her a four-sided or you know five-sided with the bottom glass box to to study her fish in. So, oh. so it, that really some people say that's the start of the modern hobby you know um, yeah so that so that puts us in right now so we're on that still that colonialism time period right that's where we're moving into as far as like where where that moves to right yeah yeah okay. exactly uh and you know the colonial period then brings us into uh and, and we basically have this rush for europe to claim every bit of the globe that they can yeah. And it's a very Eurocentric view of the hobby. And I have to say that, I mean, while all this is going on, people are still keeping koi and goldfish in China, in Japan. Uh, people are still raising new kinds of bettas in Southeast Asia. They use them for fighting. And I, you know, I also need to say too, that there were actual laws and, and um, written in stone at the bottom of these giant Buddha statues uh, in both Thailand and Myanmar that say, you know, keeping fish is bad because it leads to gambling because they knew that the common uh, workers after work would fight these fish. Um, and that's what they were doing with them for, I mean, there's it's not, it's not an accident that they're called fighting fish originally. Um, they know that for at least 500 years and now genetically it appears a hundred or 500 before that. So a thousand years or more, um, these fish were put into bowls or into a little dugout or maybe into a tray. And, um, they were also bred, uh, again, not necessarily the same concept of an aquarium or the love of the fish for it being, uh, this majestic creature type thing, but really, um, it is still, uh, in that same vein, I guess. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah. But then at the end of that period, <clears throat> you know, we start to see the, the tropics being explored. Um, 1800s, you get Africa being d explored and things like the Congo and river and things like, um, you know, deep, into the Ganges river and not just being explored, but these notions being shared with society properly rather than being myths of kind of this otherness, this other place, they start putting outposts and um, bringing out culture and resources. And, you know, whether it's leopard print hides because they're, they have these exotic cats there or whether it's feathers from a bird or whatever, um, people are in Europe constantly setting new trends and like I said, kind of fetishizing whatever it may be that's different or unique or rare or of status in their empire becomes of status back home. And mm -hmm. 
part of that is fish, you know, um, they, they start getting into like the, the paradise fish or the bettas and things like that. Um, and by that, the latest part of that period, you get, um, into, you know, uh, the South, South American part of the trade too. Uh, ironically, you know, they made it with the fish back all the way around the horn of Africa and up to Portugal in, in, uh, you know, I don't know. It just surprises me that they they make it, it all the way back there first. And then they – it took them so long to get fish from South America, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, uh, sure. and, and it's kind of a straight shot, but you do go across a lot of different temperatures and things. And to do that, I mean, they really needed heated cabins. They needed – enough fresh water to do water changes on however many fish they brought. They needed uh, food. And back then there's no fish food store, you know? Yeah. And uh, so, and it also had to be worth the money in that you have to have a rich financier say, I want, you know, I went to this territory. I was the governor in this territory or whatnot uh, in Barbados or in the Bahamas. And I want to see those beautiful fish that I saw there and i want to bring them back to london or back to paris and they want to tell the stories or show the real version of these illustrations that are kind of um becoming uh mythical in the minds of people back home you know the vi video and photos don't exist yet so there's drawings of those but there's also drawings of dragons and mermaids and you know unicorns so it's one of those like they want to see it to believe it and they want to understand it uh things and that really leads us to and you can argue that this is number five and number six kind of like colonialism and and uh the enlightenment were but you've got the industrial revolution and then you've really got steam engines and railroad all kind of combining into being numbers five and six, um, depending on how you want to split it. You could, you could say the steam engines one and the industrial revolution is another, but essentially you've got masses of people now seeing things from the edges of the empire that the rich have and the rich start actually um, understanding that the poor could rise up and do what they did in France and kill them if they don't share some of the wealth. And so in places like Paris and France and, and England, which is not far, you know, they understood what happened in, in Paris in the 1770s. Uh, and they start making places like parks and zoos and aquariums. Uh, those places did exist all the way back to Roman times, but there's this new understanding that, they're working uh, this new class of people that are very urban and they want to bring nature. They want to bring uh, and, and also project their power, honestly um, one that they have the mastery to keep these fish alive. They kind of play God in that sense, but two, they have the ability to go to the far ends of the earth and get the most exotic thing. And there's outdoing one another kind of, starts happening in in really the 1850s we start seeing the first aquarium expos and exhibits and oh. at the same time we get labor reform movements going on where people are saying i don't want to work 16 hour days at 10 years old you know and break my yeah. back in a, in a coal mine or die in a textile factory fire you know where hundreds of people die um, and live off small amounts. So as much as it doesn't seem like it may be related, it, it couldn't be more important, which is the labor reform movement and also the, uh, the industrialization or industrial re revolution. But, you know, you get things not quite like the assembly line, but you get specialization in society a lot more. So materials like um, woven fabrics or, things that used to take one person specializing in them and they made every step of the process. Now we have um, anybody can work on one piece of the process and you've got these factories and we've got new um, because of the enlightenment thinking from before we've got the scientific method. We've got uh, the understanding of the atomic 
uh, or, or the uh, or the uh, elemental table and um, you know the the concept of chemistry and physics all coming along so far and we've got steel and um, hardened metals we've got glass that's now clear and not so fragile we have the ingredients for everything you'd need for a decent aquarium finally um, for a price that's not insane however it does take some time before it catches on people were keeping their native fish in north america and in india you know when when britain british people were stationed there there's accounts of british people uh or portuguese people or um dutch people in indonesia all over these empires of europeans where they would have uh, wooden boxes or ponds or fountains and they would keep and study and take notes on the plants, the wildlife, the fish. Um, mm -hmm. But really bringing the tropics back to the city and back to the cold areas that required, you know, the steam engine that required um, gas heating uh, or coal heating of houses, or at least um, understanding that the water needed to be heated uh, and that there needed to be the air aeration, air exchange, like fountains had. So if you didn't have a big garden um, with room for a fountain and, you know, topiaries and things like that, um, this is the period where we start seeing fish surviving the journey because steamships are quicker and you also have uh, water on board, um, in, in, and with metal ships and metal holes, you get the ability to carry a lot more weight and just a lot more sturdy the way places where ships can go. And so we start seeing fish in this period. This is when we really first get the first influx, the 1850s through the 1880s. We see things like barbs, uh, more betta varieties, more garami varieties, guppies, mollies, platies. Um, loaches. We start seeing some of these fish we would recognize today in the hobby finally. Um, and, and that's the start of that. So now we're starting. So now by like, you know, I think you said late 1880s, that's when we start seeing all the, the major fish we recognize now coming back in the hobby. Right. Mm -hmm. And then a little bit. I'm just kind of unpacking it a little bit. Yeah, yeah please. Bit. I know it's a lot. We skipped. There's I know a, we, there's we a lot there. Little, there's a lot there. A lot going on. Yeah. I like the idea when we. I'll kind of back pace a second because I wrote down something. Back to seeing some of the first sort of, uh, I guess, tanks where they're starting to have like aquarium shows and exhibits. You said that was happening, I believe, in like Germany, London, Paris that time, and it was it was definitely yep. status. -y. It was definitely a status a status thing, right? Definitely more right. um uh for the well off i guess is a good way to put it and then we transition to the labor movement we have those things and you see the people i guess you get that you said that was probably the beginning of like the one i don't know what to call it the one upsmanship where everyone's kind of like trying to get more than the next person i guess if that makes sense yeah then, well you also have free time of the middle class and some okay. social mobility in that um during the same period in america too but uh, England and you, you get kind of honestly the the modern capitalist era beginning and so people are able to rather than being stuck on old feudal or caste systems where you get your your assignment in life you live on a farm and that's your farmer yeah. um, you get this change where people move to cities and take chances and try things and um, there's this new mobility that allows different degrees of wealth. Whereas before you kind of had really wealthy and then you had people that were getting by surviving off the land and farming and agriculturally. Well, now we've got a kind of middle-class in between poor and rich. And uh, that's really due to the labor movement uh, obviously, but it also is due because rather than having to do your dishes or the laundry, there's things like restaurants, there's, uh, dry cleaners, there's services and things in these cities that free people's time up so that they have time to enjoy watching fish or going to a zoo or whatever it may be. Um, that it's, it's the first time in a while that the society is able to do that rather than just worrying on getting by. So, okay. 
I, I was trying to find my question in my notes. So you mentioned that some of the cities on the, the rivers became like fish keeping sort of towns and whatnot. Does yeah. that, do you think that's kind of the beginning of like, I guess, trade in that area for like aquarium type fish Were they, do you think they were traded amongst themselves? Was it some way to come in there and trade across the country? I don't know if the, I'm, I don't think they're taking those and shipping those back across the water for sure. But I don't, I mean, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, so I mean, what we're first with the, I mean, with goldfish, it's kind of a. It, I almost don't want to count goldfish because uh, they are such hardy fish, and they were brought to the Americas by the 1780s, 1790s. Okay, um, there were goldfish in America, and in Maryland and Delaware in particular, there were goldfish farms. There were about a dozen of them, oh. and starting, you know. The you know in 1810, uh, they're very early. Um, so goldfish were a thing, and they actually, just like a lot of other things, became an industrially bred basically thing. I mean, they figured right. out how to farm them, uh, and new varieties were coming out and would get popular. And so there was some trade of that from Europe to the U.S. But you also start seeing things like um, what we're finding today. And we'll talk about it at the end, but the breaking we're breaking away from it now. But you start seeing the first real uh, domestic strains of aquarium fish, which oh. is kind of what you're talking about, which, yeah. uh, you know, because of barriers in trade, um, the first barriers were just the fish didn't survive. Right. Right. And so koi, carp, um, those kind of fish, they were easy enough to keep. And your average person even uh, could do it at, at home. And so you have generally rich people with free time or people with money, royal families and things. Um, back then, uh, especially 17, 1800s, you could basically just say, I am a scientist. And if you had money to fund your projects, you were a scientist, you know, right. and there were universities and things, but it wasn't so it wasn't necessarily bestowed upon you by others. Uh, you got credibility that way, but, but people kind of just got interested in it and, and made it a thing for themselves and built aquariums at their house or in their community. And so you start seeing varieties, you know, like the Vienna, um, the Vienna uh, goldfish or the, you know, double tail or, or liar tail or um, ranchu and just, all the way back to China, back into to Japan. And then, um, you know, they're brought throughout the empire too. So India, Hawaii, I mean, people all, all over the place started saying, you know, I lived here and I had guppies or, or I had goldfish or whatever it may be by the late 1800s. I want to bring those with me. And as we had a mastery of the sea with the steamships and the industrial era of, uh, the materials that were needed to build the steamships and maintain those fleets. Uh, we really start getting that ability for those port cities, river cities. And that, I mean, that includes Paris. It's not coastal, but you can take a steam steamship right up the river and drop off your goods from the port, you know, from the coast and same with London, uh, same with a lot of the big cities that in, in uh, America and it's really at that point that then in the 1880s, 1890s, we see the guppies and the, the guppies, um, cherry barbs, rosy barbs, um, mollies, sword tails, platies, all these fish uh, are the first wave or, or second after goldfish and koi wave of um, fish that they really start getting modified by humans and the mastery of keeping them alive seems to be handled by this point. And this is where we see that, um, you know, I want an all blue one. I want an all yellow one. And yeah. we, and by region, the world still doesn't have telephones. They have telegraphs by the late, uh, part of this period, but, um, the world is still kind of a, a far away place. It still takes months to get around the whole world. And so that keeps different very variations of these things very separate um, and developing almost into whole new creatures uh, in the sense that uh, very exciting when we finally see a, an all blue fish. If your culture had been working at all red fish, 
guppies. And then, wow, someone spent a hundred years now by the 1920s or thirties or whenever, yeah. you know, when they get back together and convene, they're like, wow, what did you guys do with the same fish? You know? And so <laughs> it, um, it, it was kind of a shock and that kind of, that kind of happens um, later. And that, that happens um, if you want to count the, the end, the, the, the part six or whatnot of that, which would be the rails with the steam engine, but um, they start going to places like you wouldn't expect it, or I didn't at least when I read it. Um, there's a great book called the toy fish by Albert Klee, K L E E. And uh, it discusses how uh, Ohio becomes kind of, and Chicago as well become these big hubs for fish in North America. And as far as the American trade goes, we're kind of going to focus on America um, just because it's easier. Now the trade does start exploding in a lot of different countries, but from here we have the invention of something called a German can or a Jerry can. And that is basically a milk can. Uh, and there was a German man who lived in Columbus, Ohio, and he basically cut down those big, tall milk cans that you think of the, the tin uh, milk cans that are like 50 gallons. Okay. Yep. He cut, cut those down and he found a, a bicycle tire pump or a, a small pump, basically like a hand pump and uh, a little pressure gauge and then a little thermometer. And he put it all together into a little, uh, about four gallon usually, but they could be as small as a gallon or as big as 10 gallons, uh, containers. And, uh, these little jerry cans or milk can crates would then be put in to rail cars. And so we were for the first time able to get things mm. over land at this point. So now you get cities like Denver or San Francisco on the other yeah. coast where, I mean, you could have brought a fish around, but, uh, you're going down around Patagonia to bring a little goldfish. Who's going to pay for that? It becomes more economically feasible to bring these fish across. Um, but, but for a notion of it, the first angelfish at the turn of the century, uh, the first angelfish were brought to New York City. And uh, they're finicky fish. So yeah. the steamships get them up there or coal, coal powered ships or oil powered ships. And they get it to New York and then they go to San Francisco. Well, the first ones went for, uh, I, I believe, the first goldfish went for uh, $17 uh, a fish, and that was for a wild caught, and they didn't know how wow. to breed them. Um, but to give you an idea, at the time, uh, at that time, you know, you could get a car, a Model T, for a couple hundred bucks. And so, I mean, we're talking maybe if we look in today's equivalent, uh, it's like a thousand dollars for an angel fish or something. Wow. <laughs> and that's if it lives. Now they had a yeah. 90% death rate at first. Wow. So this guy in, in, uh, in San Francisco, he tried something like 23 fish before he got a pair that survived finally. Wow. And, uh, he paid 17 bucks for each dead one too. Jeez. And so it's, it's really almost like these, four hundred dollar angelfish at the time i mean it'd be like a hundred thousand dollars or something these days okay. but somebody kind of had to do that with fish uh in a lot of places and that really it's it's that turn of the the 19th century um you also see aquarium clubs popping up and that's number seven um which is the hamburg aquarium mm -hmm. and also that, that later becomes, you know, an aquarium club and then affiliated with Dots Magazine, uh, which was very famous. And they also helped do the uh, L numbers and C numbers for Plecos and Corridoras. So they're pretty yep. world famous. Um, but also in the U.S., you have like the Sears catalog. So really, this period is the turn of the century. The number seven on the list is the uh, the magazine Fish Club and aquarium movement, which, you know, the, the enthusiast movement for the masses. And, uh, 
it allows kids to start reading magazines. And, um, you know, right after that, you get National Geographic coming out and these magazines that discuss travel and nature and things like that. And it's really the first time that a kid at home would would even have a concept of, you know, what this tropical fish would be and why would you even want it? Um, yeah. Yeah. So. Huh. So that's – so – I actually didn't know they had like a fish catalog <laughs> like back in the day. I mean, I didn't, I've never really thought about it to be honest, but I'm like, man, think about looking at, I remember like some serious catalog stuff and just seeing like the big end stuff. And that's when you start seeing the beginning of all things, sort of aquarium start to pop up that same, same time frame, like equipment and stuff. Right. Totally. I mean, so yeah, that, and that's exactly how is through the mail order catalogs. Um, you know, it allows them before this, that's when you get the crazy beautiful tanks that are handmade and they're like hammered rod iron. And, you know, they look like a, a really beautiful scroll work cast bronze. They're hundreds and hundreds of pounds. And then the glass is all, you know, cut nearby in, in the local big city that has a glass works. Um, or sometimes it was slate on four sides and glass on one side. Oh, wow. That was more, that was more common. Um, and oh, that seems heavy. <laughs> it's so very heavy. heavy. Yeah. And there's, so there's, there's no casual setup. You know what I mean? Yeah. There's, it's, it's a, a fixture in the house, you know, it's like a grand piano or something. Sure. Oh, there's no doubt. My gosh. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so you, you see these ornate things and, and that's the, the upper crust of society, so to speak. But at the same time, uh, towards the end of that, uh, people start wanting to emulate the upper class and just, I think we have this magnetism, this draw towards nature, towards fish. You know, some people love birds, some people love fish, some people love mammals, whatever it may be, or all of the above. But um, some people are just drawn. And to me, I've always loved standing by a Creek and watching fish swim. You know, yeah. it's just something peaceful about it. And um, it, it just calls to me. And so you know, it's these clubs really start getting people together of a like mind. And what it does is it allows that specialization of the industrial revolution and all the education of the basics of keeping these fish alive or new inventions of, you know, Hey, I tried this more and more people start keeping fish and more and more people start sharing. Well, I had success by keeping this fish this way or breeding this fish that way. And you start getting color photography, color magazine, um, even if it's just uh, not photos, but it's, um, you know, illustrations that are in color. Uh, mm. It's really impressive. You know, those first um, also trading cards and things that were kind of um, screen printed in layers with different ink. It allowed thousands of them to be printed for very cheaply rather than one expensive custom singular painting of goldfish which you know there were those too but you have to go to a museum or some wealthy person's house to see that and they had to commission someone who specifically painted a goldfish you know so really <laughs> it's the first time that the you could hear about a goldfish you could see a wood cut like a wood block uh old black and white uh etching kind of looked um advertisement for a fish or something but until you see the color the scales the reflection you know get some of the details in there uh it's it's hard to explain the magic of it and i think uh as we get that um you know the hamburg aquarium we get the shed aquarium in chicago um and and these different groups in new york and in paris and london berlin vienna um rome these places all um, really foster that. And then with the magazines too, we also get things like, um, oh, it works to, to use brine shrimp. So we're going to sell brine shrimp as a club. So San Francisco Fish Club starts selling brine shrimp. Uh, you know, nice. the, the, uh, that's how Dats Magazine actually started was the club had basically an aquarium you could visit and a store that sold stuff that was bred by a collective. But then there was also, uh, you know, they sold things like nets and just stuff that aquarists would need. Yeah. And with the money from that, they started 
doing their monthly publications. Uh, and in those publications in the back, if you recall, um, if you're of a certain age and I'm right on the edge of that age, kind of before the internet, there was always ads and classifieds and clubs being advertised in the back of those kind of magazines. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. So, so this time period, roughly early 1900s, right? I believe. Yes. Yes. Mostly. Yep. So then we get into, so now where it's like, it's, it's mostly out there. People are starting to keep fish at home. It's all, they're all been being bred. You've got the clubs that are kind of like making their, I don't say designations, but their specialty in different little areas. They're, they're kind of getting together, making some, I don't, I don't want to say decisions on different types of fish they want to keep or how they're going to keep different fish, I guess. Yeah. Well, I mean, you yeah. get clubs like uh, the goldfish club or the um, live bear club or the, you know, gotcha. Cincinnati, uh, I don't know, Cincinnati uh, cichlid club, whatever, you know, just yeah. different specialized clubs uh, as well as generalized clubs. But you also start getting books and atlases and encyclopedias and, and people going out and exploring with the ichthyologist profession having come into its own being a thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, I that. and you know, also in that enlightenment period, you got Carl Linnaeus and taxonomy. And so finally we have a Latin name, a common name across cultures for these species. And yeah. so there's also this race to say my country under colonialism or under nationalism or capitalism, they all kind of drive this, maybe even just human nature, but to say, Hey, look what I am in control of. I've got 47 species, you know? <laughs> um, and it wasn't so vain as, as that, but, but it was at the same time, you know, like it wasn't explicitly like that, but right. it's understood that, wow, they have an incredible aquarium. You know, they must, they must, have a lot of different spots around the world with exotic spices and metals and technologies and people and all sorts of things, you know? So, yeah. So yeah. That, that makes a lot of sense. So we're, we're moving through, you know, people are keeping stuff. Now the clubs are doing different things and what, what typical, I mean, what's going to, what comes next as far as the next sort of like moment or innovation where people yeah. are, it and so, a little bit more mainstream, even so even more mainstream, I guess. Yeah. So this is really, this is the period now that's that is what we would see and recognize. I mean, because four four uh, you know four sides being slate, one glass in a room that's set up for years at a time, rather than just throwing a box in your living room that you could casually buy with a couple weeks' pay. Those are very different looking things, you know. Or having a, a parlor room or, or garden or something you know, that that's very notion of keeping a tank casually and so we start to see uh world war one in between world war one and world war two uh there's this general um you know uh the the industrial revolution is technically a lot of people kind of stop kind of stop it at the turn of the century a lot of times in historic terms but it's continuing i mean things like early plastics, Baker light and things like that are coming out, understanding um, materials and physics and biology, chemistry, all that stuff's going on. And not just Sears catalogs, mail order catalogs, club catalogs, but by the 1920s and thirties, there's actually um, companies like in New York and in Pennsylvania and in, and in uh, uh, Berlin and in Munich that are actually starting to make air pumps for aquariums you know there's mm -hmm. enough of a demand that they know that they can reach out to these club people and start making things for them and so slowly these come out but they're kind of the equivalent of having a really expensive hobby to buy like stuff to build a fish room versus maybe just some guppies in a tank those are still pretty different things and it's really world war ii that blows the door wide open on your average person could have a fish room, you know, mm. if you can own a house, if you can own a house, you can own a fish room kind of thing. Well, that's uh, and, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of amazing when, when we start to break it apart, but world war two, 
you've got all the groundwork of mindset and of everything for the hobby to have been growing, growing and exploding. You know, the 1930s, you've got, then you've got TV and radio that come along. These are improved. I mean, you've got everything from, um, radar to like, uh, x-rays and just understanding nature and science in all new ways have, have come. And honestly, world war one, but world war two more. So, push this forward and we start having battles, bases, and just we, we learn how to live in the tropics as Western society. We have f- battles in Northern Africa in the desert. We have battles in the tropics of the Pacific Islands with the Japanese and the Americans and the Chinese and Indians all fighting, um, Singapore and the British, uh, the Philippines. And so, one, we have people that are from – Kansas or, you know, Arkansas or wherever it may be, um, Idaho, that are all of a sudden traveling because they're in a war and they're in this tropical location that before it would have taken six months to get there, hopping all sorts of different ships and you would have had money and have some sort of job that made sense why you were going to be a sailor. Well, now we've got, um, you know, uh, well, soon after we had nuclear powered, but you know, at this point we have uh, diesel and gasoline, and, uh, different uh, hydrocarbon fueled boats that go quickly, and we have airplanes. You know, and World War II. Yes, before that we had airplanes, but were you going to get fish from Brazil to New York in a biplane that's exposed to the weather and can't carry water for water changes? I mean, yeah, you could stop if you had a series of cities every hundred miles or whatever. So yeah, in those years before world war two, we still had, um, you know, the, the ham Hamburg aquarium, uh, and organizations like this, uh, as well as, you know, just rich eccentric, uh, ichthyologists, they would hire cruise liners. You think of like the Titanic ships like that, the kind of your image of that big steamship coming across the ocean um, in the 20th century. Uh, But they would actually, you know, hire uh, these cruise liners that maybe people would usually have taken to say South Africa from London or something. And they, they would hire older ships uh, that were still quick enough though. And they would actually uh, clear out, whole sections of the ship and put big aquarium tanks and fresh water and a crew to take care of the fish and heaters. Um, you know, since they're steamships anyways, a lot of them had heat and boiler rooms and things throughout the ship. Um, but also somebody to hatch live, uh, food and have, um, you know, live food for them to eat. And the water changes plants in the, the tanks back then was known, um, snails, things like that. I mean, this was all, studied because they were mimicking nature, you know? Um, and when you collected a specimen back then, you would look at what its environment was and try to catch as much of what you think is important to that ecology as possible and shove it in a tank. Um, but these things were still just astronomically expensive endeavors. Uh, and so you either had to have a big market and someone willing to fund it, uh, who thought that it would pay off, or somebody who was just extremely wealthy bringing back these species. And that's why a lot of species, you'll see the same names uh, in species that were discovered in the early 1900s. You know, you'll see Schultz or, uh, you know, um, later you see like Axel Rodi on like 15 different species of fish. Yeah. Um, it's because they would be named after the person who funded the expedition and things like that very frequently. Mm-hmm. Um so World War II, though, you get just the whole thing of how fish and the hobby were moving. It, it might as well be on steroids uh, because you've got the jet engine designed for, for fighting in planes, but also for transporting troops, for transporting people. So we go from biplanes and um, prop planes to jet engines, international uh, trade over you can fly over from New York to uh, England, which, yeah, you could do that in the 20s, I suppose. Um, but you're not carrying a bunch of cargo. You're not right. – it's not It's not scaled economically. But the other thing is all the powers and 
let's be frank, America at the end of the war is left standing with all these runways from Hawaii, Midway Island, um, the Philippines, the, uh, you know, Australia, uh, Guam, uh, so many of the allies uh, and the access territories were now at our, at our, you know, leisure and their colonies and territories that they had had in the, the era we mentioned before. So now you've got something like 80% of the land in the world under ally control, or at least we're friends with them enough that we could land a plane there, go visit there. Um, and America is, 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 as well as, you know, England is hurting because they've been, the UK has been bombed. They've, they've come very close to, to ruin and, you know, France been taken over and then Germany and, and, and uh, these the other, you know, countries involved with fish keeping, including China and Japan, really, uh, as well as Russia, you know, they're all just uh, emaciated economically, the yeah. populations, I mean, they're, they're in trouble. And so America is left best off. We're kind of farthest away of the big powers and we are least touched. And that, and it's not to downplay how many people died in World War II or anything on the American side, but it was not the same as the rest of the world's involvement um, power-wise. And so then, you know, we see everyone coming home from that war. They've seen the tropical fish. They didn't have to be a governor or a lord or a lady to go to the tropics, you know, for this six month tour that you, to go from England to the Bahamas that it used to take on a schooner or something like that. You know, these average people, these working class people have gone to the tropics. They've been in Hawaii. They've been in places where the birds and the fish and things are beautiful. They go, some of them stay there after the war and uh, set up trading posts and things. Same within South America. Uh, America also decides, you know, we never want to see anybody rising to power in our sphere, the Monroe Doctrine, which, you know, is before that. But we don't want anybody in our hemisphere to rival us with power. And so we really do establish footholds in every major country uh, in Latin America, Central America. And this allows us to have a fish transport transshipper or exporter or some sort of guy who's willing to take a chance and try to sell some fish. And yeah. so you, you get this influx of people um, in population influx uh, goods are, are cheap relatively and production is in the U S it's high, it's geared up and it's subsidized Uh you know, the corporate tax rate happened to be 90% at the time. So it really was an era. Uh, unions were still a big thing. So it was an era where the middle class was very large for the first time uh, in a long time. I mean, compared to other periods, you know, the Depression kind of set things back with the hobby because the Great Depression wiped out a lot of even wealthy hobbyists. But it did continue, but it's just um, not at such an extravagant scale. Um and so after that, I mean, the other thing you have to remember is this e leads to what Albert Klee in his book, The Toy Fish, calls the toy fish era, which is the sense that these fish are for our amusement. There, there are prizes, there are pets or, or, or you know, they're, they're th there's almost a objectification of them in a way that um, they start being sold um, – Lots of different places. Carnivals have goldfish and um, ring toss events and bettas are being sold in little things. And, and people are starting to actually add that corporate machinery that came from the Industrial Revolution and was so streamlined and, um, and uh, efficient from World War II. They start to add that and that the, the concept of advertising, propaganda, um, mass media, all these things are for the first time at our disposal and understood and they're applied to every facet of life. But of course, fish, fish keeping, the people who are obsessed with that, it calls to them. And so we also see the, uh, because of World War II, number eight on my list is the age of chemistry, um, which is essentially this massive 
uh, movement that happened from the 30s and 40s, but goes into the 50s where everything from pesticides to plastics, rubbers, um, polyurethane based stuff, PVC. I mean, instead of Baker light plastics, we have all these crazy new materials and going into the space age, the space race, we start getting other interesting materials, but you know, you've got, um, um, just an, an amazing assortment of little plastic doodads and ads for things. But soon people say like, well, what can we make? We can make little tchotchkes for aquariums, the little diver that, that swims up and down. We can make this not just a hobby, but we can make this a, a, a pastime a plaything almost. And so you start seeing um, also things like uh, medication too. I mean, we've dealt with tropical disease now. So we've got antiparasiticals, antifungals, dewormers, all these things now where there may have been one or two, I mean, maybe we knew about quinine, but instead of just one or two, now we've got this whole array of things and we can apply that to our fish's health as well. I think it's, I, I didn't think about the idea of sort of like the anti-parasitic medications and antifungals and stuff being applied to the hobby as much. That's kind of interesting to me. I didn't even think that was a thing. I, I, didn't, I mean, I know, I, I know it is now looking back at your, you know, you saying that, but I didn't think about that at the time. And then are our species and availability of species starting to expand as well, you think? Extremely. So you start seeing things like, um, you know, yes, in 1917, the first uh, angelfish is bred in San Francisco in captivity. Uh, 1909, I believe, is the first year ever, both in Germany and in New York, that someone bred an angelfish. But that wasn't common. You know, that wasn't widespread. That wasn't farms. By the 1950s, you start really seeing Florida in the United States, as well as a little bit of Texas, Georgia, uh, Louisiana, um, Mississippi, Alabama, just that whole Gulf Coast area. The the notion that, hey, we don't have to heat our tanks here. Some of these fish are kind of subtropical, really guppies and, um, and uh, mollies, platies, uh, loaches, uh, and a lot of different uh, ana- – um, well, I guess I won't use that word, but, uh, you know, different catfish, different loaches, different um, – labyrinth fish are all able to survive subtropic conditions, you know, in, in the sense that you just have to protect them from 50 degrees, you know, 60 degrees and colder, something yeah. like that. Um, but after world war two is the period where we really have dialed it in and, you know, whether it's uh, coil heaters, the, the amount of inventions and, and uh, patents, if you go on to Google patent, you can look up patents by the year they were filed. And there's patents going back to the 1860s having to do with aquariums. But by 1950, I mean, there are thousands of patents a year coming out by average people, average hobbyists thinking, I can make this better. We can use a plastic mold rather than cast iron or whatever heavy metal used to have to be molded before. And we can make a casing for this, or we can make a synthetic cave for plecos to breed in or whatever it may be, you know, um, all these different things just come about that you don't even think about. I mean, a plastic bottle, a uh, tin can, just, just the way we move things and the way we package things, it's all changed. Plastic bags, we take it for granted, but breather bags, Fish bags, breather bags are still a ways off. They're in the 80s that they get invented by uh, another company. But, um, I mean, the, just a plastic bag that will hold a fish. No. That wasn't how you carried fish, actually. You know, as late as the 1960s, they would use waxed containers that look like Chinese food containers. Uh, or kind of a, a solo cup with a little lid, like you'd carry to go soup in maybe now. Um, yeah, Those were common methods. Or you'd bring your own little container, your own little milk can type thermos or container to the fish store and, and carry your fish that way. Um, and really, this is where we start exploring new areas too, like um, Papua New Guinea, the heart of Kong, of the Congo. I mean, before this, 
without international air travel, there is no way to get from, you know, Kimshasa, the big, even though it's a big city in the heart of the Congo with 15 million people nowadays. I mean, even though it's this big city, you either have to go up the river for back then two weeks or something to get out to the coast or a week. And then you have to go across the ocean and whatnot. And you have to take care of the fish at every stop. Now we can overnight mm. deliver the fish straight to America, you know, or straight yeah. to uh, China, wherever it wants to, wherever you want to take it. Yeah. Uh, and so that American industrial military complex really did lay the found work, the, the foundation too, for this worldwide network of resources and uh, infrastructure to move goods, services, and obviously fish. So, uh, yeah, that's, I just look at it and like, you know, that's crazy to think about, you know, the wars, what really helped put that logistical piece in place for bringing things, you know, international across, you know, everywhere. I mean, yeah. in a more efficient manner than it's ever, you know, been done before. So I don't know. That's, that's, I didn't I never thought about it like that. That's pretty cool. As far as thinking like, that's, that's it. And, and it's, so, it's yeah. Like, like, you know, to me, obviously I, I would not want, I, would you trade world war two for your guppies? I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. But, but it's that it's not the way life works, but I'm just saying, uh, at least I guess we should look at it this way. At least some very good things did come from some very bad times in, in, in that sense. When, when humans are put to their limits and tested by humans being at their worst, right. uh, we come up with some pretty innovative stuff and then it's, uh, inevitably repurposed into, uh, all sorts of things in society, you know? And then, uh, by this time, obviously the, with the hobby growing, how are, I mean, at this point we're promoting the industry at some point, you're doing advertisements, you're doing different oh, things. Yeah. What is that? What is that? What does that look like? I guess this is my, my big question. Who's the, what demographic of people are they really marketing towards this? Is this homeowners? What I mean, basically age, I guess, is my, my bigger question because I didn't think about yeah. that time. Is it mostly just homeowners? That's a great question. Stuff like so, that. So up until World War II, really, it's it's adults mostly. I mean, yes, there's your kids that are fascinated by catching minnows in the local creek, things like that, reading about the adventures of these uh, explorers and naturalists and things. And that goes on and they, something they strive to want to study later on, but it's not something they attain as a kid. So in this post-World War II era, you get the baby boom, which, you know, everybody seems to know about, I, I would assume of this population explosion and people owning houses and the yard with the white picket fence and the dog and the 2.2 kids or what, you know, whatever it is, uh, you know, th that everybody wants to have. And this is that period when so many kids are born and people start to realize like companies like Whammo, uh, the toy company that does the Frisbee and uh, yeah. Silly Putty and all sorts of different stuff marketed by, they actually use, and this is number nine on my list, which is TV and comic books, mass media um, is that's how they advertise these things. So you get things like sea monkeys you get TV like Gilligan's Island, Sea Lab, Flipper, Jacques Cousteau, David Attenborough, all these shows coming out, um, especially when color TV comes out. It's just incredible. You know, you finally get to see, wow, that's what nature looks like or that's what that is. And, uh, and everything in production has brought the cost down, specialization as well as just um, mastery of, you know, chemistry and uh, – uh, metallurgy and things, glass works, it's all come down to this price that it can be, um, you know, literally you can buy a pump for the same price all through the 20th century, pretty much. So oh, wow. that pump, $15 air pump in the 1920s. Ooh, that's, that stings. A car was 200 bucks, 15 bucks, still pretty mm -hmm. expensive. Yeah. Um, but 1950s, that same new pump, probably 15 bucks, you know? Um, <laughs> and that's not to say like, if you want to plow our whole fish room, it's going to be a little different, but, but uh, you get the gist of it. I mean, yeah. the things get cheaper very much so exponentially almost. And, um, 
you start to see, I mean, I remember even when I was a kid seeing sea monkeys and ma- being able to mail order um, bettas and things like that in the back of, uh, I don't know, Mad Magazine and um, things like that. Uh, remember buying like mail-in chameleons and uh, things like that. Um, but you start seeing the shift of advertising to just adults and you start getting kids. I mean, it's like cereal, you know, it used to just be a thing you had to do eat. And then now there's this whole industry. Um, and yeah, it, it attracts adults too. But I mean, even look at today, it's, it lays the groundwork for things like glow fish, like, um, uh, tattooed fish in Asia, which are very popular where they'll put like a lucky symbol or they'll tattoo, um, you know, a pop, pop, pop culture reference on the side of the fish, you know, um, that's not allowed here, but, uh, it was in the 1950s and sixties. It was very common in the U S that we would get fish like that. And you would see all sorts of weird color fish. And, and sometimes they weren't bred that way. They were literally seen as a commodity. And it was like, if it dies, we'll go buy another one next week. They're affordable, yeah. you know? And at this point, this is when you really start getting all the species uh, and maybe to care for say discus or saltwater species and things like that. Yes. It is still very expensive and you need specialized gear or, you know, if you're, I mean, rainbow fish really weren't on the the radar that much, but you've got things like um, killifish and other niches in the hobby where people need special um, like for instance, distilled water to get things to work right or they need to remineralize things. And this is where, I mean, people originally are just doing it because they have to, and they get creative before this period. And a lot of the magazines are really DIY, like building things and, and what household chemicals you can use to change things. I was actually thinking while you were talking like that, and I just found this out recently. Um, my dad told me my grandfather, had a really nice tank of discus and i believe he said like the mid 80s like that was his yeah thing he had to, and he had those fish for he said he had them for over 10 years and i thought he said it was like okay. mid 80s and i'm like i was just thinking in my head i'm like i one i never knew that i never knew my grandfather had fish like i've never yes. never saw him had a fish tank you know this was right this would have been like right before my family started with the farm and wow. i just i just I, I just i literally it could have been like three days i found that out i'm like i never knew Pod fish. Yeah. But only a, he had freaking discus. Like, yes. like, yeah, he had like he had a whole tank of them. He's like, it was his prize. It was his prized possession. And um, so, you know, an interesting thing about that is, so by the 1950s, really is when after World War II, like we said, when you could have any fish that you could get to, that's when discus come back. Now, people yeah. kill an awful lot of them. Uh, yeah. There aren't a ton of variants in the the hobby, but. Um, and that's that specialized hobbyist, like I was saying, not yeah. for kids, but you see things like that. You see later on in the sixties, the late sixties, you see the rift Valley, all the Mbuna and like Tanganyika, like Malawi, all those kind of fish come out. Then later we, in the eighties, we see rainbow fish and we see, um, you know, uh, new interesting little fish, uh, the nano fish movement comes on later and then now we've kind of come in full circle where we're looking again at rainbow shiners and native fish to the north american continent and we're looking at um least killifish and blue sail killies uh killifish and um mollies you know are entering the hobby again and and people are interested not just in fish because they're colorful or uh have big fins or whatnot but now we're starting to see also with the aquascaping movement, we see that people are going back to that. I want to replicate nature in the aquarium, not because I can't keep my fish in a, you know, in the 1950s and sixties, you start getting everything marketed that you could imagine, whether it's like uh, your favorite TV show in the aquarium, like a Batmobile underwater for the fish to live in or whatever, you know, made out of plastic and bright pink gravel and bright green uh, gravel and the, the cords, everything's colorful and synthetic. And isn't it great what, what chemistry and color and, and artificiality we've mastered. 
Well, there's kind of a, a reaction to that and to that fast food culture, to that um, uh, post-war culture. Uh, and we want people start getting back into artisan and craftsmanship and uh, rimless tanks. Uh, the design of your tank is instead of just being the cheapest thing that holds together, um, you know, people get into collecting Euro frame, like old, old school tanks or, yeah. um, you know, and really that whole, that rounds off our, our, our discussion today, which is the internet era is number 10. And that's really mass communications, again, going by leaps and bounds on steroids. You get people who don't have to pay membership, don't have to commit to anything. They can just hop on their computer, now their phone, and communicate with experts around the world. Yeah. And so you have a question or you figured out how to cure a disease that nobody could figure out, not even scientists. Hobbyists very frequently, farmers, hobbyists, uh, you name it. I mean, anybody involved in it that loves the hobby and pays attention is just as viable of a place to get your information uh, on something. I mean, there's many scientists that may have named a fish, but your farm down in Florida or in Southeast Asia, the people who run it may know far more about that fish in reality than the person who knows what its bones look like, you know, or, or yeah. it's, it's uh, features and where it lives in the wild. Um, and you've got this kind of um, renewal also in uh, koi. And then you start getting into even more uh, niche fish, like little silver fish that maybe uh, the subtleties of a minnow or a, uh, a one inch long fish were not, it wasn't flashy. It didn't show empire. There's little silver fish here. You know what I mean? Uh, it, but now people are into say Madaka rice fish. Yeah. They're into um, lamb chop rasboras or um, uh, Sabwa uh, splendens or, you know, or I don't know, just, I'm just trying to think of little things that are, uh, they're not as flashy. They're not as big. They're, they're not necessarily as unique or exotic looking, but we have access to a world of things. And now simplicity is kind of valued by some also because of the aquascaping. Like in the eighties, you start seeing plants um, really like all sorts of hundreds of species entering the hobby for people who know about it. Now, mainstream right. culture in the nineties, I still didn't know about plants. I knew you could have uh, an, a little upon a Geaton or a tiger lily or something in your tank, but never did I, was I taught or told, or did I hear that you could balance your tank much better? And, you know, they would have babies and stuff. I didn't know that until, I mean, honestly, until college, I didn't find that out. And it was aquascaping by Takashi Amano that first woke me up to that. I saw, uh, this, this, uh, aquarium he did that was like a full wall and it just looked like a beautiful, tranquil stream, you know? Yeah. And, and it, 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 it was a balanced ecosystem. And Diane Wallstead's another person in by the eighties and nineties, uh, Crystal Castleman with aquatic plants. Um, and, uh, you know, we start getting people sharing their information. Um, you got the, uh, it, and by the way, um, it was Herbert Axelrod. That was going to bug me really bad. I don't know why I said David. Uh, but yeah, Herbert Axelrod's the, the big name that a lot of people uh, love to hate. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, the other thing that happens is in the 1950s and 60s, there are over 800 licenses for fish farms in Florida alone, mostly family fish farms. Well, by the 1960s, late 60s and into the 70s, they start to get consolidated. Now, last time I talked to someone down there, and you probably know this better than me, I think they said there are 178 registered farms now um, in the state of Florida. Something there's, like that. There's probably... 
registered farms, I believe there's more. My wife could probably tell you. She sits on the Florida Aquaculture Association board, so she has like a list of all the permit 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 ones. Mm -hmm. But is but now that encompasses everything. So that encompasses um, shellfish, food fish, which is now becoming right. the okay, most yeah. progressive market. But for right. commercial ornamental farms, it's probably right under a hundred. I'd yeah. say between 70, 75 and hundred when it was a lot more, even 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's just steadily gotten consolidated and there's good things in prices that come with that sometimes, but there's also, you know, there's pros and cons to everything, but um, just like this hobby in general, now we get people think, saying that, well, I want these oddball fish that nobody else wants. So I want, you know, this fish that isn't, it's not a big money maker. So where am I going to find it? Nobody imports it. And yeah. so some of these fish are now are getting more popular. It's kind of come this full circle thing um, of going back to basics or back to your roots in some ways. And it seems like a lot of um, medications and things even for, and treatments for things like I just bought a treatment um, that's sold in Japan and it's betel nut, which is just a nut from the tropics and it kills planaria like crazy. Huh. Kills all nematodes and snails. It dehydrates them from the inside out. Wow. And, uh, I mean, just little things like that. I mean, uh, tea tree oil, stuff like that. There is kind of this notion that maybe we've been over medicating and maybe we've been using too many chemicals to fix problems. Maybe we can balance our tanks by using the right amount of light or CO2 and food and uh the right substrates you know maybe we can set it up right in the first place and that's really what the internet and the uh the modern era brings back and it kind of steals a bit i mean you're still going to have the toy fish you're still going to have the bettas at places big box stores but we are seeing a, a reaction to to that and the notion that hey these are sentient little creatures um maybe we shouldn't keep them in a little cup um and have massive losses in transit just because we can, cause it's affordable. I yeah. mean, just because a, um, you, you get things like project Piaba and people considering the kind of cust of these fish, so to speak. But now the consumer is empowered to tell the sourcing bodies, you know, whether that's a seagrest or, 5d imperial trans shippers on either coast you know whatever it may be farmers like yourself um or or whatnot but can say you know i i don't want fish that were caught using um a car battery and dynamite where 90 percent died and they you know bombed the reef essentially and collected what floated to the top stunned you yeah. know um or whatever it may be i mean uh the the uh, Cardinal Tetra, I just read the other day, I mean, in 2021, they're paying um, $4 per thousand fish, which is essentially a kilo. So $4 US for a thousand fish caught. Uh, that's what the that's what the exporters are paying for, from the collectors? Correct. Yeah. From the, uh, Pia, what are they called? Piaba... Um, I don't know the name. I, I, Piaba I know Rias or I, yeah, Piaba, there's a name, there's yeah, a name there's, for them. Yeah. There's yeah. a name for them. I always mess questions. it up. So I, I shouldn't yeah. attempt it, but, <laughs> <laughs> but oh, yeah, yeah, I mean, so, so there's that going on. And then there's also places like project Piaba where they're saying, will you pay six bucks for this fish instead of three? No. And that's, that's where now we have the information. We have it in our hands and we can tell you or the farmers or the breeders, uh, whether that's locally or commercially, you know, this is what matters to me and I will pay more for it, but it is incumbent upon us to educate ourselves and to know where this hobby has been, where know our, where know the, the chain of where our fish have been. And, uh, and I mean, once you have the knowledge, um, you have, the ability to, to do something about it. I think you have the responsibility, I would argue to do something about making it be the system you'd like to see. Um, so well, yeah, and I, I think maybe that's kind of a good spot to, 
that kind of rounds off where we're at now. Like there's not that there's an end to this hobby yeah. or anything or, or, you know, but, but that, that rounds off the list in the sense that, you know, now it's this power to the people hobby. If we want it to be, you know, where the people can dictate what happens in the chain of uh, uh, production and so forth. Uh, but the beginning was this uh, aristocratic uh, rarefied um, and uh, fetishized kind of like, Ooh, look what I have. It's so rare. And so you can't have it. So that's <laughs> why it's cool. And now it's kind of, you know, I want to support uh, a, a rainforest that's being deforested and uh, an indigenous group of people that are running out of uh, jobs that are environmentally sound. And this is a way that they can have a sustainable living, you know, when we pay them a bit more, it's like fair trade coffee or, or whatnot. Um, you know, we can, we can start to change things. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely, I definitely agree with that a lot. <laughs> A, a, a lot of that, I mean, it, it, that's a passion thing of mine is like, I think people need to have the information at their hands about the whole process of their fish. Same, it, really similar to coffee. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I think if you give them that information, it, whether they use it or not, you know, you probably should at some level, um, at least having it there so people can make their own informed decisions. I think, I think it's where the hobby's headed. I don't think it's there necessarily yet because I don't think the information is super easy to get for some of the species but i, I like that it's, yeah. i like that it's heading that way and i and i like that so and it's something that i'd like to work with people like you like i'd love to have you on my channel so you could help inform more people you know sure. and things like youtube things like podcasts they are freely consumable information sources which is so incredible i mean what a time we live in when you can get college or you know university level uh education you can get someone who spent 80 years keeping fish and kept notes and wrote a book you can get that synthesized down to the important parts or the new parts and thrown online in a blog post you know when yeah. you had to do experiments for 80 years to figure out <laughs> what the trick was to get this fish to do you know to breed or whatnot yeah. and so we really stand on the the shoulders of those who went before us in this hobby and in, and in life in general. But, um, because of that uniquely human thing of our communication, our language and, and writing and, uh, mass communication now it's exponential where we're going, you know, yeah. it, it, you don't have to tr reinvent the wheel every generation. Uh, or if something dies because of a frost, uh, there's a lot of different um, redundancies in both information and in production lines and things. I mean, we saw that we went through a pandemic and we still have fish available for retail sale, you know, um, so through yeah. all of it, they were they were deemed essential stores, pet stores. So yep. it's kind of a crazy world. <laughs> for sure. All right. Well, I guess. I guess we'll wrap up there, man. That was, this was fun. Uh, enlightening a lot of, I mean, I came into this really excited cause I didn't know, to be honest, I didn't know a whole lot of anything about this. So not knowing it, not having a whole lot of background information on like how it sort of transpired over the, you know, time frame. It's just, it's just fun. It's fun to know. It's fun to have that information and really see the trend, like how other, you know, events in the world transpired and, caused these sort of outcomes and was helpful for the industry. So super, super cool. And uh, I want to say thanks. Thanks again for doing this. This has been, this has been fun. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a, a, an honor and a pleasure. And uh, you know, if, if you want to pick apart this stuff, I mean, obviously each of the things we talked about, there are hundreds of hours you could talk about this. Oh, yeah. um, I, and I mean, maybe now people kind of see how could you have a whole hit channel that in theory is about history and aquariums or history and fish or, and uh, there's a lot to unpack there from different eras all the way up through just the biological history, so to speak, the evolution of fish and the ecology of fish. But um, yeah, it's, it's been fun. So, you know, thanks for uh, letting me, letting me uh, talk so much and uh, <laughs> it's been <laughs> great to, to chat with you. And uh, if people want to find more, they can, uh, find my channel and uh, 
I kind of break things down into, to, you know, smaller chunks, names and things. Tried to leave that out for the most part today because with the exception of a few uh, big, big names in the hobby, um, we could get tangled up in dates and names forever. But sure. we kind of wanted to go through the themes. So Yeah. And then I will have all of uh, Alex's contact info and where you can find them uh, in the show notes or the YouTube description, whichever it's at. So all that will be there. So go check them out. Let me what you think, and then uh, I guess we'll call it quits. So uh, I quit. <laughs> quit. Quit. All right. Well, everyone, uh, take care. See you guys next time. Thanks.